So I think that that's a, a, a great um, stage setter for a, a panel about conviction integrity units. Um, and I, I guess one of the things that I would say that I think uh, all the people on this panel would agree is, Dan, when you talk about the DNA case that's a lead pipe cinch, I just got back from Austin where we're doing a root cause analysis of the closer of their DNA lab uh, because of quality issues, which just goes to prove you that even a DNA case is not a lead pipe cinch. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we know that there are a lot of times, and I, and I think I'm on record as saying this, I think um, you know, almost every time uh, we have a, a conviction that is inaccurate, uh, it is done, as in other industries, not because you have a bad actor, uh, though sometimes in criminal justice that is the case, but much more often because of uh, a number of different circumstances, a number of different issues coming together uh, and conspiring and contributing to a, a situation where a bunch of, uh, of well-trained, well-intended professionals end up being involved in a case that's sort of a never event where we, where we, where we make an error about uh, somebody's uh, actual guilt or innocence. Um, and one of the really uh, encouraging things, I think, that is uh, trends that's going across the country now is the prosecutorial acknowledgement of that. Um, and DNA, I think, has been a really valuable tool there because DNA does provide objectivity uh, that kind of penetrates the belief system that we don't make mistakes. Um, and, uh, and from there, groups like the Innocence Project and, and more recently, hopefully, uh, like ours, have helped people to think more thoughtfully about um, why those things are happening and, and deal with them. Um, but the prosecutorial response to error, uh, sort of institutionally, has been the Conviction Integrity Unit. And it's a pretty rapid uh, trend. Um, you know, I don't, are you going to take credit for being part of the first conviction integrity unit? Because Santa Clara and San Diego are going to, you know, they'd puff their chests out too and, and, and deal with that. But, um, but conviction integrity units started really uh, in the mid to late 2000s and really started to, I will say Dallas is the first one to reach sort of national uh, prominence. Um, uh, Tampa, Hillsborough County, Florida, announced on Tuesday that it's starting a unit, uh, the second unit in the state of Florida. And uh, when, when we did, uh, we did a national survey of conviction integrity units in 2016, uh, and we surveyed 21 of the then 25 units around the country, um, by my count, Tampa is 46. So, you know, from 2005 uh, with one or two, to uh, 2016 with 25, to 2018 with 46. Uh, it's clearly a trend that's not going away. And I think it speaks, uh, Dan, to the thing that you've said about sandboxes, right? I think um, one of the things that, that I would encourage prosecutors to do is to ask their peers why they are not doing some of the innovative things um, that, that, that you guys are doing. Um, they're gonna get asked it at election time. Uh, better to be asked in a supportive way now than a contentious way uh, two years, four years from now. Um, but I think what we're seeing is in elections, people are saying, well, every other jurisdiction around has a conviction integrity unit. We should have one too. Our community's worth it, don't you think? Um, and, and that's been a really interesting trend to see. Um, but CIUs raise a lot of questions. So, you know, and, and we consult with a lot of jurisdictions that want to start units or reboot units. Um, how do I start one? What cases do I take? What should my protocols and policies be? How does it interact with my appellate unit? How do I handle the skeptics, the defense bar, the community, and sometimes my own attorneys? Um, and then there's the one that I'm sure none of you have had to deal with. How do I fund it? Right? So, I mean, a lot of really important questions. And it's easy to say, yeah, I want a conviction integrity unit. And it's easy to say that sincerely. Um, but the execution is, uh, is always the challenge. So we've got a terrific uh, group of folks to talk about that today. Um, I'm going to uh, start here with uh, Vanessa Antoon from the NACDL, the Senior Resource Council, who runs education programs to train uh, CIU attorneys to work with defense attorneys. Um, to her right is Patricia Cummings, um, the, the first Conviction Integrity Unit free agent. So uh, she, at the just under the trade deadline, moved from Dallas to Philadelphia to uh, join the NFC East rivals and uh, help to improve the Philadelphia Conviction Integrity Unit. Uh, to her right, we have Tom Eicher, uh, who is um, uh, running the uh, 
Office of Public Integrity and Accountability, a new office created by the New Jersey Attorney General. Uh, and Tom has been tasked with creating the first true statewide uh, conviction integrity unit. So that's a, a, a fascinating challenge, because now you're not just starting one, but an interlocking series of how many? Uh, 21. 21. So we're going to go from 46 to 67. Uh, you know, in one fell swoop there. Uh, and then finally, last but certainly not least, is Mark Rodert um, in the Chicago State's Attorney's Office where he is kind of rebooting that office with, um, with Kim Fox. Um, we will be having people going around uh, collecting, uh, handing out and collecting note cards. If the note cards aren't in front of you, can I ask one of our helpers to bring them by? And then what you would do is just, uh, if you have a question, Right there in the moment, don't, sit, don't hesitate, write it down and hold up your hand and uh, we'll collect those cards and, and bring them down here. Um, so I'd like this to be as much of a conversation as we can, but just to get the ball rolling and use moderator's privilege. Um, Mark, I'm going to throw this one at you. So, so when we get a lot of questions, we often get the question, well, geez, John, what's the best conviction integrity unit in the country? Or what's the worst conviction integrity unit in the country? And the metric that people want to use is exonerations. Um, if, if a unit has exonerated lots of people, it must be a great unit. If it hasn't exonerated anybody, it must not be a great unit. And I try to explain that I think that's a flawed metric for a lot of reasons. But Chicago is pretty interesting because when we did our survey, we interviewed your predecessor in the role, and Chicago had a fair number of exonerations, but a huge amount of public skepticism. And I think when uh, State's Attorney Fox came in, you may disagree with this, this is just my perception, but when State's Attorney Fox came in, there was a lot of question about, well, when's the Conviction Integrity Unit really gonna show us what she's made of? Uh, and so I wanted to talk to you about the challenge of um, either creating or restoring public trust in a unit um, when you've already had some exonerations and people still don't buy what you're selling. Well, uh, I think there's a couple of responses. First, exoneration is one of those words that, that gets used in an imprecise way, and lawyers always react to the way media uses terminology. Uh, for example, in Chicago, we've released, or excuse me, we've vacated the convictions for over 50 people uh, in connection with a group of officers who were clearly corrupt and they were putting drug cases on people that were conjured. Now, Barry Sheck made an interesting comment to me one time when he said, you get credit for exonerations. Those weren't exonerations, they were vacating convictions. And I agree with that 100%. And it, the distinction for the defendant may be sort of ephemeral, but for me it, it is important. We reserve the term for uh, an exoneration is a person whom we've concluded is, is not guilty of the underlying offense as opposed to those cases where we concluded that the police officer couldn't be relied upon to give us an accurate story of what happened. So we couldn't stand by that conviction. But it really is a different and, and I think quantitatively different thing to say, you know what, that person had nothing to do with that crime, never should have been convicted. To the second point or to the second response, I think the problem, in my personal opinion, the problem that my, my, uh, the predecessor state's attorney had was that the conviction integrity process appeared, to me at least, to be very ad hoc. It didn't seem to have a standard approach. It didn't seem to, there were no published guidelines, which I think is just absolutely life critical for the existence of a conviction review unit. And it, it sort of became this basket for the cases that were hard to deal with, hard to explain, a lot of it involving DNA. But I think the biggest issue was I perceive, and I wasn't there, but I perceive that in those days, when a case just wouldn't go away, when the controversies associated with it because a newspaper was on it or because a, a group of Innocence Project advocates were on it, the case just could no longer be explained, then a sort of conviction review process would be brought forth and we'd say, well, we should let these people go. And, and one of the things that, that I think Kim Fox did, and I believe in very strongly, is there should be a unit. It shouldn't be, well, occasionally these hot cases that we can't explain or can't get rid of should be given to our uh, top people in our criminal prosecutions division and they should come back and tell me what to do. Instead, we've now formed a group that exists and functions outside the chain of command of the criminal prosecutions unit and that is designed exclusively to look at such cases without waiting for them to become problems we can no longer explain away. 
So um, you raise an interesting question about policies and procedures, right? I mean, I, on, the, on the one hand, we're all lawyers. We like policies and procedures. We like to see them followed. Um, on the other hand, um, Mark Hale, who runs the unit in Brooklyn and I think is really thoughtful about these issues, I hope he's watching on the web stream so that we can give him a little shout out. Um, you know, Brooklyn is a unit that does not have policies and procedures, and Mark's reason for that is he actually feels that these cases are all so unique and nuanced that he needs extra flexibility, and he's concerned he'll be boxed in by policies and procedures. Well, uh one of the things that I thought was important was I want the community at large to know what what the standards are. I want the people in the Department of Corrections, uh, I want the families, I want the lawyers to have a, a, a known target that they can look at to see. Uh, the second thing that I feel is this. These are controversial. You talked about the headwinds. I know all of us have faced the headwinds. You didn't mention one of the most difficult issues that I confront, which is the attitude of the judges, who feel like, who are you and why are you messing with my judgment? And who elected you? Uh, there's no statute that creates a conviction integrity unit, at least in my jurisdiction. This is a matter of executive grace. And so I feel it's really important to set forward standards so that people know this is not just my opinion is better than that of the jury, that of the appellate court that affirmed the conviction, maybe that of the post-conviction. It isn't a matter of here's, here's just my coming in and sticking my nose into business that, that I don't belong in. It instead is here's the approach we're taking. We're going to put forward our standards. We don't say this is what you have to show us, but we do say these are the eligibility criteria. Here's how we're going to proceed. Here's what we're going to ask of you. For example, I notify defendants in my written policies, I well might come to you and ask you to waive your Sixth Amendment privilege, or your attorney-client privilege, rather, so that I can talk to you about what you said to your defender and what he said to you or she said to you. That may be something I want to look at. But I just want all of that to be known before we start. So I want to come back to attorney-client privilege, and I'm going to ask Vanessa to reply to that. But before we do, Patricia, um, let's talk about judges. Uh, and I, I think in each of your jurisdictions, maybe you've had some different challenges, right? Because as I understand it, in Texas, when there's a case where you want, you know, to, where you believe there's actual innocence, you have to find a legal remedy that may not be obvious under Texas law, and that may involve certainly interacting with the judge to figure that out. Um, but then more recently here in Philadelphia, you've, your office has taken an interest in uh, something that, that, that Dan mentioned in his last panel, uh, sentencing, and how we handle sentencing. And there you're interacting even differently with judges. So let's talk about what's reasonable to expect from a conviction integrity unit, given the other players in the system and the roles they have. I think that the starting point for me to answer that question, John, is to tell all of you guys what a lesson I've learned in just nine months in being Philadelphia, because so much of what we do in conviction integrity units is driven by the jurisdiction that you're in. And so some of my Texas colleagues are here, and I came from Texas thinking, oh my gosh, Texas was terrible, we had all these problems. Um, and one of the big fights that we had was the way that the criminal justice system is set up that if, as a prosecutor, you agreed that somebody was innocent, you believed that the law supported that and the facts supported that, you couldn't just go say that means we vacate. You had to go to a trial judge. A trial judge had to agree. Then, if it was a case involving a prison sentence, the highest court in Texas, which is the equivalent of the Supreme Court in Texas, had to then look at the case, and they had the power to do what they thought was appropriate. And many times in Texas, even though you had prosecutors, and particularly you saw this in Harris County quite a bit, even though you had prosecutors saying, undo this conviction, the Court of Criminal Appeals would say, not so fast. We don't agree. So I really did think Texas was terrible. Um, then I come to Philadelphia. Um, and, and it's so, so many lessons to learn here. And, and I will say, 
one of the first lessons I've learned is I'm, I'm not so sure that we should be assuming that this kind of work is necessarily a partisan type of work. Um, now I'm able to look back at Texas, which is a red state that may be changing, and I understand even though I thought that there were problems with the system, Texas is so far ahead of what I see in Pennsylvania right now as far as conviction integrity work and being able to undo bad convictions. So now I'm in Philadelphia working for probably one of the most progressive DAs in the country, and certainly he's got the commitment to allow us to do what we think is right in, in regard to bad convictions and innocent folks. But the problem is it's so hard to get anything done, and that's really a product of the law in Pennsylvania, but also the judiciary. Um, and I think that you know what we've seen so far, and it's only been a minute, I've only been here about nine months, but what we've seen is with the law as it is and with judges kind of, and I think, Mark, you mentioned some of this, um, saying, who are you to come in and try to undo what we've been doing for years? We are having a very difficult time even getting out of the state courtrooms. Um, and just real quickly, I'll illustrate, we did broaden our scope in terms of what we're willing to look at. And one of the things that we said we wanted to do was very much what Dan has done, which is we want to look at excessive sentencing issues. So we start off with what we consider to be very low hanging fruit. So the first three cases that we take to court involve sentencing issues that also have some guilt innocence issues as well. And we think that this is easy. We're going to be able to go in and convince the judge, on the one hand, that we were dealing with any legal sentence that was void. Can't we just fix that? And we got a prompt, not only no, but hell no, essentially. And the case was dismissed. And then we had a couple of other sentencing issues where we actually started in the federal court. We get a federal court judge ordering that the conviction and sentence be vacated, send it back to state court to essentially replete it to an appropriate plea and sentence, and then we get a state court judge saying, no, I'm not gonna do that. Um, and so that's just an example of what I'm seeing so far. And it's, you know, and I say this, anybody who's considering having one of these units that doesn't have one, you have to be very aware of the different types of pushback you're gonna get. And I think that the pushback is gonna depend a lot on the jurisdiction that you're in. Um, so I, I think that, John, I've maybe answered your question and gone a little bit beyond it, um, but it is, it's certainly been very eye-opening to me because although there's a lot of similarities in what we try to do as far as best practices are concerned, there's so many things that are unique to the jurisdiction that you have to figure out how to deal with. So um, in being good to my word, let's, let's circle back and talk for a minute about uh, attorney-client privilege. I mean, Mark, I know you've been both a prosecutor and a defense attorney, and so you're going to be sensitive to both sides of this issue. I've always thought that the attorney-client privilege uh, issue, the issue of do we ask a, um, a petitioner in a, in a conviction integrity case who's got a plausible claim of actual innocence, and asking that person to waive attorney-client privilege while presumably they've still got an appellate process going on to be really challenging. Because on the one hand, um, I, I get the prosecutorial view of, hey, I'm going to put all my cards on the table. Uh, I'm going to invest in something that is kind of a volunteer activity that I don't legally necessarily have to do. Um, I want to make sure that you're all in on, on transparency and honesty, too. I can also see the, the petitioner's view of, you got to be kidding me, right? The price to have you look at whether I'm actually innocent is I have to waive a constitutional freedom, pull the other one, right? And, and so um, I guess as you do your training and as you think about this from the defense attorney perspective, you know, how do you approach that, that question? Um, well, it would be different in each case, but yes, as a defense attorney, you immediately think, why am I waiving this? Do I have to waive this? And that can be a barrier to a desire to work with the conviction integrity unit, depending on the case. So I think, as Mark said, one of the important things to start out with is some transparency and to find out what the procedures and policies are. Um, is that something that's necessary? Are you going to have to do that? Is that going to deter people? And at what stage would that occur in the entire process in terms of screening and review and deciding whether they're going to look into a case. So that's a big thing as well. Um, what commitment would the defense attorney be making um, just to have the case get into essentially a screening or review process? And at what point would they be asked for that? 
and it's weighing differently in each case. And also, is you know, is that is that something that is necessary to get the case into the screening and review process? I understand everyone wants to have a um, a commitment to some transparency and to use the resources for the appropriate cases, but there has to be also a middle ground with that initial defense response that, um, you know, what are we looking at here? And also, what's the result going to be of the review at the end? If there is a conclusion, you know, what's that conclusion going to be um, in terms of helping the defendant go forward with their case? Could there be something that's just inconclusive it's not really going to push the case forward. It's not bad or it's not good, but it may end up hurting a little when you go into court. And, and, that's, the, and that's the result of the um, Conviction Integrity Unit review, just, you know, is there a chance that there won't be a determination? So I think one of the things that will help with that is some type of transparency and letting the defense bar know. From my position at NACDL, I get inquiries across the country on all, all different topics that defense attorneys have. And the level of training and experience and familiarity with appellate practice and post-conviction review can vary greatly depending on the jurisdiction um, where people are. In some communities, the defense attorneys are appointed to cases like this um, more frequently than having them in a post-conviction unit or something like that. And in those cases, I think it's a lot more challenging for defense attorneys who haven't handled a lot of these cases to understand where to start and what to do. And I think doing some trainings and working with the prosecutor's office and conviction integrity units can go a long way to getting everybody on the same page and helping everyone. Because um, there could be cases that would be great to review if defense counsel doesn't know how to get it into the process and doesn't really know where to start. Um, that can be a barrier. When, when uh, I opened my, uh, a new office when I was a defense lawyer, a friend gave me a beautifully framed quote of Edward Bennett Williams when I was a defense lawyer, and it said, you would have to be a mongoloid idiot to waive the Fifth Amendment privilege. So I fully appreciate the need for people to, to protect that. I should point out, when, when we come in, we usually are the last resort. Uh, all appeals have usually been exhausted, and so there's less of a concern that what's going to happen might, because I don't want to implicate or, or, or prejudice anybody's uh, opportunities down the road. The other thing I would say is it's, a, it's as narrow as I can make it. Ordinarily, what I'm really looking for is, what were you telling your defender, your public defender, at the time of arrest and, and arraignment and, and at trial? Uh, I'm not looking for a waiver. For example, if you're not represented by counsel in the post-conviction efforts, I don't care to know what's going on there. This comes up for me a lot because we hear a lot about, I had an alibi. There were four people who could have said that I was at their home. I kept telling my public defender that. He kept telling me <clears throat> he would investigate it. And then all of a sudden, we went to trial and nothing happened. Those are the kinds of things I'm trying to tease out. And yeah. I, I was just going to say, I completely agree. And I think that's one of the things to just understand going in. And also, when you Speaking might. Speaking to the mic. Oops, sorry. <laughs> to just understand going in what. Um, what is expected and what you're looking for, and also at what point in the process you should approach folks in a conviction integrity unit if that's what you want to do. So then you don't have to be scared going in and um, you know, know what you're waiving and can make that decision, because in a lot of cases that's, you know, that's going to be the best thing to do. Yeah, it really, the timing issue I think is key, because if you, if you, the earlier in the process you engage in a review of it, the harder it is. So if it's on direct appeal, but you see an injustice, do you jump in? Then I think the waiver issue becomes really right. It's really difficult. I come from federal practice where literally every habeas petition alleges ineffective assistance because it's, we frequently had um, waivers of appeal and waivers of right to 2255. So the only way you could get a, the only exception to the waiver was ineffective assistance. So it fed into this process. So that if you're, if your conviction review takes place after appeal and after the, uh, you know, post-conviction review, then you, in most cases, already had a waiver from the defense. I think for me, the trickier thing in looking at this is asking the prosecutor's office to waive privilege with respect to the prosecution file. And that's something we're, we're kicking around. And part of my concern in setting up a statewide issue is I'm, every single case that I'm going to review, my unit will review, 
is somebody else's case. <laughs> so it's not the prosecutor saying, we want to look at this ourselves again to see if we got it wrong or there was a mistake. It's an outsider, although I represent the Attorney General, so in New Jersey, it's, it's an appointed position, it's not elected, and um, the Attorney General has supersession authority, can take over any case in the state and take jurisdiction of it, which is what allows us to go in and, and do this. But you can understand as a practical and political matter, I have to be understanding of the prosecutor's office who brought this case feel strongly about the case, and so, mm -hmm. If the first thing I do is come in and say, give me your entire file and I'm going to turn it over to the defense attorney who now represents this person, you can imagine that's a difficult conversation to have. So that's something I'm struggling with. And I think certainly the file has to be reviewed by somebody and by my unit or this unit that's going to be set up. Whether, whether it should be shared more broadly, I think, is a, is a trickier question for, for those reasons I just said. So. Can I jump in and add something? Because I'm hearing this, and, and what I'm hearing is potentially three different issues when we talk about waivers. Um, first and foremost, in regard to asking defendants to waive attorney-client privilege, I never took that position in Dallas, and we don't take that position in Philadelphia, because I just don't think it's necessary to ask. And I was a defense lawyer for many years, too, and I just think I don't have the stomach to ask for that. Um, however, I will say that in, I'm, I'm trying to think almost every case that I've worked on from a conviction integrity unit perspective that has actually gone to court and resulted in some relief. An integral part of the investigation that we engage in is that we want to talk to the defendant. And so far, I've never been told no. Um, so I think that by using that as a tool, you maybe get to the same place you want to get to without having to ask for you know, that waive your attorney-client privilege and, and automatically sow seeds of distrust in terms of the collaboration. Um, separate from the big issue of attorney-client privilege and waivers, I think it's important to talk about two other kinds of waivers. One would be, I also think it's important that when you do the work on a case, it is critical that there is at least a waiver to get you access to the trial defense attorney's file. Um, if you don't have that, the, the person that's coming asking you to do the work is putting themselves in a very bad position because more often than not, the cases that we look at are going to allege some sort of Brady problem. And if you don't have the ability to look at what the trial attorneys did, you're going to be very limited in that type of review. So that's what I wanted to add in regard to waivers. And then finally, I will say just to comment on the waiver from the prosecutor's point of view in regard to work product, anything in the prosecutor's file, I believe that you give full access to the file. Um, and I believe that in Dallas, I believe that in Philadelphia. I, and I, I will say, you know, I will talk about that in terms of a general rule, because I think there's always going to be some exception where there might be something that you feel like you have to hold back on, maybe for victim safety, witness safety, something like that. But as a general rule, if we're saying we want to collaborate and really look at a case to see if we got it wrong and if somebody is innocent sitting in prison, I just feel like you got to say, here's what we had. Take a look. Let's figure out what it means. And, and just for clarification, Patricia, in that case, is that something that's shared with external partners uh, as part of that process? And do you have any anything in place that limits the further dissemination of that? Absolutely. What, what we're doing, um, we did it in Dallas, we're doing it in Philadelphia, and it's been a little bit of a work in pro progress because we want to have good forms, and this kind of goes back to what was said early on. I mean, you do want to have some policies, some procedures, and we absolutely believe in forms, um, and one of the forms that we use is called a discovery and cooperation agreement, and it, it actually sets forth many different issues, but in regard to the question that you asked, Tom, we specifically say, and we require the defense attorney and the defendant to sign it, we say, look, we are going to give you full discovery, <clears throat> but 
in order to get it, you have to agree and understand that there's limitations on what you can do with that discovery. So one of the obvious restrictions is we say that it can't be disseminated. And what, what I have fortunately been able to do because of my work in Texas, I have borrowed language from the Michael Morton Act in regard to the open file discovery statute that was passed about four years ago. And we've taken the language in regard to limitations on what can be done with discovery and we've stuck it into our discovery agreement in Philadelphia. And, you know, we've only been using it for a short period of time, but so far so good. Um, we're not getting defense lawyers complaining about it. We're not getting them saying, you know, look, we can't do that. I think that they are just happy to know that we're going to share the file with them and they understand that what goes along with that is some obligation and responsibility with the information they're getting. So I think that um, the, the Brady conversation is uh, interesting on a lot of levels. And tomorrow afternoon, we'll have Bill Wersky uh, from Collin County in Texas to talk about uh, you know, the, how, how the Michael Morton Act has affected practice there and, and, and how Brady and plea bargaining should intersect. Um, and I, I'm on record as saying I think Brady has a, is, a, is a fundamentally flawed standard that puts prosecutors, trial prosecutors, in a very tough place because you're trying to project materiality going forward, and you're going to be graded on that test by somebody who's got a different theory of the case looking backwards. Uh, so I think it's a really hard place to be. That said, these conviction integrity unit cases, these post-conviction post uh, actual innocence cases often do have Brady claims. Um, and the, one of the, oh, and this is my moment to remind people to fill out their cards, because one of the questions that we got so that you know that the system works um, is how do we, you know, how are we talking about uh, the need for dealing with uh, abuses of prosecutorial discretion. And so, you know, Tom, you're in an interesting position because your office, on the one hand, is going to be a step removed from all the other offices in the state that are receiving these cases, which ought to give you some independence. On the other hand, your office is also dealing with integrity and corruption claims, and that might make your review of innocence cases seem a little bit more like uh, a punitive mission as opposed to a mission for uh, truth and accuracy um, independent from that kind of accountability. So I guess I'd like to ask you what your thoughts are on that. And then Vanessa, I'd like to ask you how you talk to offices about how to balance those two things, about how do you get information with the support of the attorneys while dealing with the fact that other people might be criticizing the trial attorney's behavior. So uh, that's a good question. And the answer is I'll let you know. Um, yeah, I should the, say it's unfair to ask you to take any policy positions now because your office is really just getting started. Just, so. I just left uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office after about 32 years. So this is, I've been two months in this job setting it up. So the, what complicates it a little bit even more for mine is one of the things that falls within this new unit of uh, public integrity and accountability is I run the internal affairs investigations of the prosecutors the 21 county prosecutors or DA equivalent, if they're personally involved in misconduct. So you can imagine that engenders me to a lot of goodwill as well. So, um, but I hope that through t treating people fairly and openly and, and that that won't be an issue. I, I don't really see um, the disconnect uh, because I think, I, first of all, I have good relationships with many of them because they're former prosecutors who I've dealt with. and and. So that's a good starting place. And I think uh, it's just being transparent. We, as we, there's a committee that's been set up and John's on it to help uh, make recommendations about what this unit should look like. And we've got a number of county prosecutors and other prosecutors and defense uh, uh, bar on that committee. So I think their input about the process is gonna be important, but I don't imagine ultimately un giving relief without engaging the current prosecutor in that discussion. Not to give them veto power, but to get buy-in from them on what's happening. At least they're gonna understand why we reached the decision we reached. Or, or ultimately, it's not mine, it's gonna be the Attorney General making the ultimate decision. Um, and uh, hopefully they'll buy in. And I, I also suspect that turnover being what it is, It'll be a little easier because these will be somebody else's convictions. You know, these will be older, and so it'll be a predecessor that they don't really aren't, won't feel as uh, uh, close about. But we just had two, recently in New Jersey, we had two uh, convictions for uh, murder set aside, and that did create and still creating a lot of controversy. And, and uh, so handling that is going to be a tricky part of the job. Um, well, I will say 
I'm not putting this forth as the position of NACDL, but in terms of Brady and discovery and materiality, I would say that that's the standard <clears throat> on review and not the standard to begin with, that it should be exculpatory evidence that's turned over and that there should not be an assessment of whether it's material. If there's something that's exculpatory, it should be turned over and it shouldn't be um, judged at that point on the review standard because that's not the way it should be. I don't see any need to, at the time, say, well, this evidence is exculpatory, but it, it's not material because that's not a decision that could be made by someone who doesn't know all the facts and the, and the strategy of the defense. So I'll just put that out there to start with. Regarding getting files and information from defense counsel along the way, that I think both from the prosecution and defense side, you have to try to overcome the idea that someone starts to defend themselves instead of worrying about the client. And we would all hope that doesn't happen from the defense side, but that's the instinct to say, I, I didn't do anything wrong, like anyone who has had a habeas or something like that. And if you practice long enough for a defense attorney, you will, and you will get that. And you will have to say, you know, this isn't about me having a dispute with my client. This is about doing, you know, saying what's accurate and what's right. And I would hope that defense counsel can, but there, there is that, especially in th you know, like capital cases and things of that nature when someone is on death row or someone is incarcerated for a long time. But I think you just have to work with people um, and just kind of get that trust and cooperation that this isn't about saying you did anything wrong. At this point, we are just trying to get the information. It can be a little challenging, but um, you know, hopefully everyone can get on board to get the right result. And I've seen so many defense attorneys, you know, I've made a mistake, you know, go in and admit it, and hopefully everybody can do that on both sides. You know, this to me kind of, there's an element in the room feel about one of the aspects of this. If there, I told Kim Fox, the state's attorney in Chicago, if there was one thing I would change, I would not call it a conviction integrity unit. I would call it the wrong guy group because people who use the English language would tell you that a conviction lacks integrity if there was a Brady violation or if there was incompetent assistance of counsel or if the police coerced the confession. And one of the tensions that I think anybody who's starting a unit is going to experience is those issues likely have been litigated and, and, and addressed it at probably the trial and the appellate level. And it's, it's essential as far as I'm concerned individually that the undercurrent or the, the principle of all of this work should be, are you innocent? Because if you're innocent, then that Brady violation is a very relevant thing. Then that trial lawyer's unwillingness to investigate the case is a very relevant issue and all those other things. This is one of the things that I like to say in, in our public policy, or our written policy, rather, is first order of business is you got to tell us that you're the wrong person, that you just had nothing to do with this. Then, yes, we'll look at these other things. But as I've, and I, I write a letter to everybody who sends in an application. My name is, I'm popular in the Department of Corrections. A lot of people have had correspondence with me. And I will write back, and I've, I've written to some people, and I've said, look, I agree that the police behavior in your case was unacceptable. I also think you're probably guilty of this thing. And so the unacceptable behavior isn't my department. That's down the hall. I'm only here to find out if you're the wrong guy, and I can't see that you're the wrong guy. And, and that, I think, has to be the overarching principle that you think about when you think about all of these policies. Yeah, so I, I mean, I actually, um, when we did our survey, we. Um, we didn't use the wrong guy unit as our title, though I like that. Um, but we did use conviction review unit uh, rather than conviction integrity unit. Because I do think the, the, I think the idea behind the name, you were closer to it than I was, but I think the idea behind the name was not that the people lacked integrity, but that the conviction did. Right. Um, and, and, and it was almost integrity in that structural sense, right? Not in the moralistic sense. But it's easy to get uh, misinterpreted. And, and I think when, uh, you know, any professional who, who puts their heart and soul into their job when you're then going to go back and review it for an error. I mean, we see this in healthcare and in transportation and in all sorts of other places that that's an unpleasant thing to think about when, you're, when, you're, when your job is never to make a mistake and then somebody says, hey, we think we might have made a mistake. Uh, you're going to have some psychological things to, to work through there. Um, 
So we've gotten a couple questions, and I, I don't really know what the, what the answer is to this. I'm just going to kind of throw it out to the panel. And the, the, the question is, you know, I think, um, Dave, correct me if I get my metric wrong here, but something like 75% of prosecutors' offices around the country have five or fewer prosecutors in the office. Is that roughly right? The average size is 20, um, yes. So, so lots of small, part-time, not even uh, you know, they have other jobs. And so one of the, one of the trends that have, we've seen in conviction integrity units is, uh, or wrong guy units as we're now calling them, um, <laughs> is that they typically are in large urban offices. Uh, and, and I think that's for a couple of reasons. One is sort of statistics. You handle more cases, you're likely to have uh, more, you know, the, the, same, the same rate of error across the country with more cases leads to more errors in larger offices. Uh, but it's also a resource question. And it's a resource question of if I've got, you know, Brooklyn has 600 attorneys, they can put 15 attorneys to a, uh, to a conviction review unit in an office that has five, um, you know, that's a, that's a bigger issue. So we've had a couple of questions come in about um, what we would suggest for more rural jurisdictions that want to be responsible and thoughtful um, with the challenge. Now, you know, the statewide uh, approach, Tom, that you've got, I think is a terrific potential answer to that. Um, uh, but not everybody has an attorney general that can simply wave a magic wand and, and make it so. So let me ask you guys what your thoughts are on, on how that might be done. Well, my, I have a bias that is in favor of having a person run, operate the, the unit who is not a, a current member of the prosecutor staff and who doesn't have the ambition that I had when I was hired as a young prosecutor to advance within the office. I think it's, it's if I were uh, to c imagine a five person prosecutor's office in a rural county, and I've gotten calls from, from smaller counties in Illinois where they say I'm the person who does appeals and post conviction and now I'm gonna do this conviction review. I like the, the, uh, the, the thought process and I like the attitude. I don't like the process that they're actually using. I think it's inappropriate or unfair to put that burden on somebody. So I, I would suppose that I would want the, the, the chief judge of that district or circuit to appoint a group maybe of, of one prosecutor, one public defender, or one defense lawyer, and maybe one other practitioner, even another layperson. I'm generally in, in a larger community like Chicago, I'm not in favor of, of citizen panels. I know some places they use them and I, I understand the thinking. But I think in a smaller community where I think also the number of cases is gonna be much smaller, I think you have to take it outside the, the, the prosecutor's office. My thought, um, if, if we're talking about just a, a really small office and they're not gonna be able to go outside the office, how do you, how do you kind of educate them to understand that you don't have to have a unit to right wrongs? And I guess for me, the bottom line is there's so much training out there now um, that small offices can be attending and paying attention to and, and understand that there are red flags. I mean, I think what we've learned from the DNA exonerations and other exonerations is you're gonna see some commonalities in cases where you've got the wrong guy. And so the more we teach people in smaller offices and then the more we send the message that you're allowed to look at it a little differently. So let's say you've got one appellate prosecutor and maybe if that appellate prosecutor is trained in regard to the red flags, the leading causes of wrongful convictions and they feel like they can speak out and say this might be one of those cases and have some sort of support from the leader that maybe there are times when you don't just defend the conviction but you say this one requires me to take a deeper look. So I, I think it can be done and I think in addition to the, the training and the education, I think we also want to send out messages to the smaller offices that the larger offices have these units and almost everybody I know that's running one of these units is glad to help um, the smaller offices. We're constantly having those conversations that we would love to be resources for the smaller offices and just be a sounding board if nothing else. So I, I just do think that there's ways to deal with it. Um, and, and then I will add one last comment and this is I'm learning more from Larry than anything else as we also look at different ways of being innovative in prosecution, I think we also understand that 
if you're not necessarily prosecuting a bunch of cases that you traditionally prosecuted, the DWLIs, the small amounts of um, marijuana, you may free up some resources in the office that will allow you to spend time maybe on other issues. And I would say that conviction integrity is one of those issues. So maybe you don't have to go get money from your commissioner's court, but you've got the ability or the bandwidth to spend more time on these issues. I agree wholeheartedly with the less prosecution of low-level offenses if, if, you don't, if you don't need to, definitely. And I would just say on a more big picture scale um, that NACDL is working with APA and is going to be working with some other stakeholders to assess the needs of conviction review units and prosecutors in addressing wrongful conviction from the perspective of reviewing and remedying and preventing. And under a federal grant we have, and the goal is to see what is needed out in the fields with the idea to report back to the government for potential funding or potential funding from other sources. So in a big picture, it's not going to help you immediately <laughs> um, type of project. We are seeking to work with stakeholders in the field. We're just getting that project ramped up with um, Dave and others with the idea that, you know, what do the prosecutor's offices need? What do the conviction review units need? What does law enforcement need? What does defense need to all work together to um, find these cases, review these cases, prevent this from happening um, to begin with, and also identify the actual perpetrator, which is always a goal of the Department of Justice in doing these funding projects. But to get that information, see what collaborations work, see maybe what models seem to be working best in big jurisdictions versus small, and to at least have that information to maybe try to fund a person somewhere or try to expand the units and also do some trainings and collaborations with people in um, you know, targeted areas to help, you know, help things um, work that way. So that's what we're doing, and hopefully we'll be working with a lot of you in the coming weeks on that. Um, so one, one quick thing, and then, I'll, Dave, I'll, I'll say it to you. I know in Lake County, for example, uh, Mark, to your point about involving uh, people from the citizenry or people from, you know, he's got a, a, an advisory panel that's made up of people outside his county. So Lake County is a, a well, I guess it's not really a, a beltway county because you've got the lake on one side in Chicago, but it's uh, it's a suburban county outside of uh, outside of Chicago. And, and Mike Nurheim, the prosecutor there, will bring in volunteers from other jurisdictions in different roles to sit and serve as advisors to his office on how to handle that. So that is something that he's used effectively, and it, it may work in this context as well. Dave, does it, you want to add? Yeah, I was going to say one of the ways is we don't need to reinvent things. It's, it's how you build it. Uh, this came up in the Nevada prosecutors. So I, we presented on conviction integrity to their state association. The, it was the smaller county, so I'd love to do it, but if it's not Reno or Vegas, it's not going to happen. After a little bit of punch, as we started talking about it a little more, that we, we created a model, and the model's actually been used. Look to your neighboring county, right? And pass it to each other, because likely in those jurisdictions, and many of them have even have circuit judges, they know the defense bar, they know who the courts are, and maybe they even have a, have a bit of a relationship with that uh, particular investigatory agency. So, it, and that's what some of the Nevada prosecutors have done, and it, and it led to, to uh, one of the cases. Also, it's respect for your fellow office and, 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 and uh, electives. So therefore, it comes in, you look at it, and it, it, it is pure, it's a great model of independence as well, because you're taking that entire case, and you're giving it to another prosecutor's office, and saying, look at it, and come back and, and, and give us a recommendation. Um, so, so many times, yeah, you don't have to recreate this something, and I, I love everything Vanessa said. We're about to get a survey out there, either unit or process, because Dan Satterberg was key. We've got a lot of offices that have a process. They don't necessarily have enough cases that, that they have actually created a unit. So as much as people can talk, how do we do it? Where do we go? What do we look at? It, it'll be much better. So um, we have a question that um, is kind of near and dear to my heart, you know, because we do uh, root cause analysis of, uh, of cases where everybody can agree that something, we've had an undesired outcome in the system. Uh, and a, a, an inaccurate finding of guilt or innocence, I think, is a pretty easy one for everybody to get around and say, hey, you know, reasonable minds can differ about what should be a crime. Reasonable minds can differ about what we ought to do with somebody who's committed a crime. But pretty much everybody agrees that we should probably only punish the person who committed the crime um, and not somebody else. So 
you know, you guys in, in conviction review units are in a unique position then to, um, to advance the cause of learning from cases where we've had this undesired outcome. So the question that we have is, does a conviction review unit have a role to play in the training of police uh, and other prosecutors, perhaps other people, about the causes and prevention of inaccurate convictions? Well, I, I think the answer is absolutely. And, and uh, I'm on a little road show right now in Cook County. We have a very, as you would guess, a very dispersed group of courts and divisions, but I'm making pretty much every other week a, an address or a presentation of lessons learned to uh, prosecutors to try and tell them. And I'm sure that Patricia and, and, and Tom and Vanessa would all, you see earmarks. You see, my, my nightmare is it's a gang shooting. It happened after dark. There were an, a, a, you know, so many shooters. Some people say four, some people say five, some people say, and it's this over-inclusive charging. And, and you know, there's no direct evidence. The only evidence against the sixth or seventh person in that scenario is that one, two, and three said that he was there, but there's no other evidence that ties them. Those are the kinds of things that I want people to think about critically. And I want to, you know, we have to be better at the charging analysis and, and some of these things. But so the answer is yes. And as you may know, Chicago, the situation with the Chicago Police Department and the relationship between the department and the prosecutor's office has been better in the past, perhaps, than it is now. That's not to say it was qualitatively better in the past, but now uh, these are tough issues. And, and the, 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 I don't think if you held that, that plebiscite among the Chicago Police Department about whether there should be a CIU, I'm not sure how we would fare in that analysis. But so these are, these are tricky things. But certainly, the benefit of a, a the obvious benefit of a conviction integrity unit is that you take people out of jail who don't belong there. But I do believe that a very second place benefit is you hope that that doesn't happen again and that you've learned ways to avoid it. I, I would just add, um, absolutely, you're right. But one component that I often find myself learning the hard way is that in addition to teaching um, what leads to wrongful convictions, I think it's very important to teach within your office what the Conviction Integrity Unit is doing and what you're all about. Um, I often said when I was in Dallas, I was probably one of the most hated persons in the DA's office. Um, and when I came to Philadelphia, I thought that would be dramatically different given the leadership difference. Um, I'm not so sure that it's dramatically different. Um, and I am learning regularly that a lot of folks are just, they're defensive and they're afraid of what we do. And so one of the things that's on our agenda is to figure out how we go and talk to all the prosecutors in the office about what we're doing um, and, and not just why we're doing it, but how we're doing it. So hopefully there will be more buy-in and acceptance of having a unit within the office. I, a big part of the, of, uh, the convic conviction review unit we're going to set up is just that. What lessons can we learn? The one thing I, I, I do raise just as a scientific matter is, given how few examples we have, can you, can, is it fair to extrapolate to these larger issues? I think we can all see this happen. We see eyewitness identification maybe that, that um, comes in or that, you know, five guys and the bad guy says he was there, two of the bad guys say he's there, but nobody else says. But um, I do think it's important to do that, but I think it requires the rigorous kind of research you do, John, because I, can't, I don't want to make, I don't want to change the rules for 10,000 cases because one case was wrong, because maybe that was just a, an outlier. So I do think it's important to really study it and not just use my gut reaction for it, but I'd, I'd be interested. We haven't talked about this, so well, let me totally first say disagree, that, but... Uh, let me I, first say that it absolutely does require the rigorous research that the right, Quattrone Center does. And funding, does. especially. For <laughs> uh, and nobody else can do it that way. I mean, there's just no, no question about that. No, seriously, though, we, when we, we did one of these, we've done a couple, uh, several of these in, in different jurisdictions, um, and Jan, I was looking over at you when Mark described his fact pattern, because uh, the, the Baltimore state's attorney uh, did recently exonerate somebody on a fact pattern very, very similar to the one that you described that we'll be working on in the future. Um, but um, with the first one of these we did in Philadelphia three or four years ago, um, the, 
representative from the police department was a deputy commissioner named Nola Joyce, and she stated at the time something that I've come to call the Nola Joyce rule, because I'm clever with names like that. Um, and and the, the, the rule was, look, if you guys want to talk about making a change that would have prevented the outcome in this specific case, I'm happy to talk about it, but this root cause analysis is not an opportunity for everybody to grind their policy acts on all sorts of things that they might want to talk about. And I think the idea is you can, you actually get different solutions when you ask the questions of what would have avoided specifically things in this case. And so I think it's really important to, to confine the interrogation that you're doing, the interview, the review you're doing to that specific case and think about how to prevent that outcome because you're kind of playing whack-a-mole and it's, you know, right. as with the, 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 the types of cases, that, the petitions that come your way, you're learning from each of them and kind of modifying your policies going forward. So too, the responses are going to do that and, and it's going to be an iterative and, and cyclical process. So we're a couple minutes over time. I want to give Vanessa uh, the, the last word and then I've got one <laughs> sentence of closure uh, and then we can have further conversation uh, during the break. So go ahead, Vanessa. I will just say quickly that I agree with what everyone has said. And I mean, the Innocence Project tracks the um, causes and contributing factors for the DNA exonerations, so the wrongful convictions in those DNA exoneration cases. So that does illustrate um, the contributing factors in a lot of these cases. And I would just say I don't think it is enough to tell prosecutors or defense attorneys that forensic problems or eyewitness identification or misidentification of certain forensic evidence can be a contributing factor to wrongful convictions. All these groups need to specifically know what that means. You know, what is it to potentially have something that could be, you know, signs of an eyewitness identification problem or a false confession problem, or what is reliable or unreliable forensic evidence, or just what are the limitations? So, and I'm biased because I organize trainings on those issues, but I really do think that it's not enough to just say these are some of the factors. People need to know in detail what does that look like so I would know some warning signs if I see it and can investigate further. So I think that's very important. Yeah, so that, I think that's completely true. I also think it's true that we need to understand the limitations of what a conviction review unit can do. So a conviction review unit can educate about best practices and eyewitness identification, but the police are going to have to implement that policy. And that may or may not be uh, under the control of you know, the chief law enforcement officer in the, in the jurisdiction. So it's all well and good to, to have conviction integrity units be sources of these root cause analyses, but it then has to go out to the individual participating uh, agencies to do that implementation. And that can't always be dictated by the prosecutorial role. So um, that's the end of this. I would be remiss if I did not point out that the Bureau of Justice Assistance has seen fit to grant the Quattrone Center some money to do these root cause analyses analyses uh, in multiple jurisdictions across the United States, and we are currently taking applications. Uh, if you have a case with an undesired outcome and you'd be interested in learning more about that process, please reach out to me and we'll follow up. And uh, please thank our fabulous panelists for starting us off on the right foot.